Hey folks, welcome to the Transplant Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle. Now today, very briefly, we're going to be talking about the ejection fraction, what it has to do with your need, your potential for receiving a heart transplant. It is answering the bigger question, is that the only number you need to be concerned about? Go ahead and stay tuned. Hit the subscribe button and click the bell notification to become part of the Transplant Helper community. Well, hey, folks, welcome to the program today. Let me remind you that today's program is brought to you in part and sponsored by secondchancetransplants.com. If you've not already visited their website, please go over and do that. They've got tons of information there. It's a huge community that's growing, one that we're kind of joining with here on my program. So go ahead and check them out. they got a lot for you to look at, to view, and to learn over there as well. But with that being said, today we're actually talking mostly about the ejection fraction and how much that actually has to do with your potential, your need for receiving a heart transplant. Now I know when we hear about our ejection fraction, normally shortened as the EF, when we hear that our ejection fraction is very low, that can cause us to panic. I can remember back about eight, nine years ago when I was going in for one of my very first heart caths as an adult. I came out of the cath lab, they'd already also done some other testing that day, brought me out of the cath lab, woke me up and told me my ejection fraction at that point was about 40%. I remember hearing that and thinking, oh, that's got to be awful. You know, on a test in school, if I made a 40 out of 100, I was definitely failing. Okay, that was well below average and that scared me. But I learned a little bit later that the common or average ejection fraction on anyone, even someone who is healthy, is actually about 55 to 65%. That's 65 being a definite athlete, maybe a runner, a swimmer, someone who bikes, you know, a real athlete might get to that 65% mark. Most of us hover in the norm average of about that 50, 55%. So being a 40 that day wasn't terrible. It was a marker that something was beginning to go wrong, but it wasn't necessarily terrible. Now, with that being said, I've heard of a ton of people who are waiting for transplant who are definitely considered to be in complete heart failure, maybe stage three or even four heart failure, where their ejection fractions are so 20% or less. And I'll put a chart up here on the screen in a moment you can look at that'll help you determine your ejection fraction and if whether it's considered to be mild, moderate, or severe, or maybe just normal. Okay, so the chart will help you to see that. But anyway, while you're looking at that, let me tell you a little bit about how the ejection fraction is determined. Basically, they go in and measure the blood levels inside of the heart. I would say pooling in the heart. That's not very technical. But in the ventricles, both before and after the pump is made, okay? And that's called the end distolic before and after. So they're looking at the distolic uh, side of things, the amount of blood that's pumped in and out, and how much is left behind in either one of those chambers after it pumps. And so it's just what it sounds like. It's the ejection fraction. So if the heart fills up with, uh, you know, so many milliliters of blood on one side or the other, how much is actually being squeezed out of there? And that gives them a good indicator as to how weak the muscle may have become because if the ejection fraction is low, that indicates the muscle itself has gotten very weak. So it's not able to squeeze that way. It could also uh, be caused as well, though, by arrhythmias, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But the ejection fraction, it is an important number. It is one that they're going to really look at. But I want to say that right now that it is not, it is not the only number that indicates major heart failure as well as certainly would indicate that you need a transplant. You can live with very low ejection fractions, yet still maintain a decent quality of life and with some medications and a little tweaking here and there, actually come out pretty well. So it doesn't always equal need of a heart transplant. There are a few other things that are measured, though, that help to play into that. Not only the ejection fraction is measured, but the overall cardiac output has to be measured. They basically look at that by seeing a, a formula that says what the heart rate is versus what the stroke volume is. So they're seeing, again, how much is the heart actually opening up and contracting and and how much is it doing that per beat and so they can kind of measure sometimes you know you hear them say your heart's weaker on the right side and they're noticing that it's not pumping necessarily in in succession to itself or, or something like that so it's not the fact of how much it outputs here the overall cardiac output and volumes are more how much can it take in and versus how much it actually does put out so those two numbers the ejection fraction the overall cardiac output albeit are very similar are measured with a little bit or slightly different formula. So those two things matter 
for sure and without a doubt. Now, next to that, and I've kind of put these in my logical order. They may not be yours. But next to that, if you're considered being major heart failure, they're really going to want to take a look at something like your uh, pulmonary function, okay? How well is your body able to convert the oxygen that it needs to get it to the bloodstream so it can be the energy to keep you going, okay? And they're going to really do that in several different ways, all of which are going to require you to wear a mask, uh, a Spilometer. I can't say that word. That's not what it is. I put it on the screen. But they're going to look at the spot. I can't. I won't want to even try again. They're going to look at that, and they're oftentimes going to do that while you're exercising. Maybe on a treadmill. Maybe on a bike. Uh, maybe I can remember one time they did something like that to me. They put me in a little box, and I think they actually. It felt like at least they sucked all the oxygen out of the uh, airtight box, and it made me try to breathe in that. They they figured how much stress your lungs are under, and then in turn measured its capacity, its flow, and the gases that were there. So a lot of times they would find in me. Uh, uh, in my condition, at least pre-transplant, that that was more where my problem was. Yes, heart-related because my heart was weak, but it was in the pulmonary function where they saw all the difficulty because I had no energy. I had shooting pains in my muscles. I fatigued, gave out quickly because my pulmonary function was bad, and it was not converting the oxygen and, and expelling the carbon dioxide like it should. So they're going to measure that. Number next, they're going to be looking at what's called your cardiac enzymes. Now, this is basically just done through a blood test, but the cardiac enzymes can be a first defense indicator over whether you've had a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. It's going to be able to measure any damage that's been done to that muscle. Now, once they get that information from the blood draw measuring the cardiac enzymes how elevated they are or something then they will proceed with other testing which could include something as simple as an x-rays to see the size of the heart uh, whether or not you've got some kind of a fluid around the heart they're going to measure in turn uh, with an EKG as we called it now it's called the ECG if you got an Apple watch or something it's the ECG but same test that's going to really be a big determinant over whether or not you may have had a cardiac infarction and if so where the damage is done and the ECG EKG can help to determine that they're going to do other tests that go a little farther than that but the cardiac enzymes are a good marker so once they notice the uh, ejection fraction the overall cardiac output through various testing the cardiac enzymes are going to be kind of a daily checkup, not necessarily daily, but a routine, less invasive checkup to see if you have really got a problem. They're also going to be looking for things like arrhythmias, and they may do that in several ways. Again, they can find that on the ECG, EKG. They're also going to do that. Um, you know, by putting monitors on. You may have heard of the Halter monitor, which is basically a 24-hour heart monitor that just records everything that's going on through little sticky pads and leads, records everything that's going on for about 24 hours. They can in turn pull the information from that and see what your real arrhythmias have been. And you may be suffering with atrial fibrillation. That's one side of it. Ventricle fibrillation, that's another. Ventricle tachycardia, which is also called the rhythm of death. Very dangerous. Um, you know, something as simple as, as PVCs, which is basically your heart kind of boom, 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 beeps hard and then skips a beat or two. And that's kind of where mine was first noticed. I ended up with VTAC later. But, you know, they're going to notice for all those arrhythmias and try to determine you know, if you've really got a problem, that's going to have something to do with this, not just your EF, but these other tests play into that. Now, they go a little bit farther than that. They're going to go into doing various tests to continue to confirm all of this stuff. Of course, the echoes, they can do an esophageal echo or Doppler where they actually put a probe down the back of your throat and they can see from the back of the heart so they're not having to look at it, you know, past the lungs and the chest wall. They can do all of that, and that helps, again, to constantly measure and get good, accurate measurements of how the heart is functioning. They'll put you in a cath lab sometime. They'll look for all of the above in the cath lab. While they're there, they may pull a biopsy. That's another thing they're going to do. And the biopsy can show the deterioration of the actual muscle itself. And that's something that I was dealing with. My muscle itself had gotten stiff and hard, and it wasn't able to do all that was it was supposed to do so you know just problematic but that brings me to all of this and in spite of the ef in spite of the overall cardiac output in spite of the pulmonary function the cardiac enzymes the arrhythmias all that which i dealt with at times and some at others really here's what you need to hear it comes down to quality of life you could have terrible numbers in the cath lab awful looking pictures on the echoes and that sort of thing x-rays 
And if you can still function, you may not necessarily be ready yet. Doesn't mean you won't be, but you may not be necessarily ready yet for a heart transplant. So it comes down to quality of life. So here's what you and I need to do as potential patients and even post patients, the same thing. Number one, know your body. Know how you feel. Know what your uh, capacities are. Know how much you can exercise before you're strained. Know, you know, how you're supposed to feel. What do you feel like every day? Some of us feel like trash almost every day. And so how much trash do you feel like? You know, are you ready for the landfill or or maybe just something that you kind of toss in the in the kitchen can? I don't know. That's a crazy description, but... You know, you got to know where you are, and you got to be able to help them measure that. And they're going to talk to you about your quality of life a lot. You know, what are you able to do? What does the typical day look like? If you're someone who gets up in the morning like I used to, takes a shower and has to go back to bed because they're so tired, not good. Uh, if you're trying to brush your teeth and, and you just feel like your arm's heavy, not good. Um, I used to eat meals. I would, I hated eating lunch because once I ate lunch, boom, time for a nap. I couldn't keep going, you know, just a lot of little things. And they're going to be looking for your quality of life. And they're going to be measuring whether or not that quality of life you have now is substantial enough to keep on going. Or they're asking, can we improve this potentially with a transplant? So that really plays into it. So when you go into your doctor, be totally honest. If you don't feel good, tell them. If you do feel good, tell them that too. And they're going to be watching. They're going to be watching everything. Um, I can remember. Uh, and this is still the case, it's about a two, two or three tenths of a mile from the parking deck to my doctor's, to my clinic, uh, a walk. If, if you stroll in there on your own two feet and you're complaining of all these symptoms, they're going to notice that, you know, not that you ought to take a wheelchair just to show them, teach them something, but, you know, just think about it. Be honest with yourself. How do I actually feel? Is it really worth going through this process to potentially gain some quality of life? Most cases, yes, but in every case, maybe not. So anyway, I hope this has helped you out in some way. Be totally honest with your doctor. Let them know if you're having problems. Express them how you really feel every day. I appreciate the question. I appreciate anyone who has a question. Please be sure to comment below these videos. That's perfect. You can tell me about your life, share your story, ask your questions. You can find me over on Twitter at uh, transplant underscore help. You can find me via my um, uh, email, jim at thetransplanthelper.com. Of course, I'm on Facebook Messenger. Just any number of ways, reach out to me and I would be more than happy to help. Thank you so much for joining me today. And until next time, stay stronger, friends.